everyone. I am Andy Anderson. My partner, Ike Allen, and I are the co-owners of Avaya University. Thanks so much for joining us. In this event, we're talking with incredible fellow experts. We're talking with therapists, psychologists, doctors, best-selling authors, and more. And they're here to provide you with tools and strategies to help you experience greater happiness, peace, and joy in your life. Today, our guest is going to talk about overcoming anxiety and depression with amino acid supplements. So please welcome Dr. James Greenblatt. Hi there. Hi, good morning. <laughs> good morning. At least it's morning for us at the moment. Um, thank you so much for doing this. I'm excited about this topic. Yes, I've been practicing psychiatry for 33 years, and there's a, a lot that we can do to help uh, patients struggling with anxiety. Mm, awesome. So I'm going to tell everyone a little bit about you and your amazing work, and then we'll, we'll start talking about that. So Dr. Greenblatt is duly board certified in adult and child and adolescent psychiatry with over three decades of experience treating clients with complex mood disorders, eating disorders, and other mental illnesses. He currently serves as the chief medical officer and vice president of medical services at Walden Behavioral Care in Waltham, Massachusetts. An acknowledged integrative psychiatry expert, Dr. Greenblatt has lectured internationally on the scientific evidence for biochemical interventions in psychiatry. He has also published multiple books and articles for professional and consumer audiences on how to employ a comprehensive approach toward mental health treatment. So there's probably, I could be talking about all the stuff that you do for much longer, but I'll just move on to questions now. So because we're talking today, obviously, about right amino acid supplements, I know one of the things that you, that you talk about in your work is stomach acid, right? What is stomach acid and why is it important for us? Well, it's uh, kind of critically important uh, to digest protein. And one of the uh, things that are not always... Um, uh, is not common knowledge, is, is all the chemicals in our brain, all the neurotransmitters in the brain. We hear about serotonin and dopamine, norepinephrine, and the uh, uh, neurotransmitters that uh, affect our mood and behavior. They're all built or synthesized from amino acids that we get from food. So if we don't have adequate protein in our diet, that we're not gonna be able to build these chemicals to um, naturally treat our anxiety and depression. Mm. So acid is critical to digest protein from our diet. Got it. So is there like a, I mean, right, there's the standard amounts that we, we hear about in the world of nutrition as far as what kind of, like how much protein we, we should be getting, but is, do you have a different recommendation based on what you've learned? Well, it's really not the, the amount of protein. So much of the work that I'm doing now I'm seeing individuals and, and that are um, trying to do everything they can for their health. So they're eating the perfect diet. They're flying in the you know, salmon from Alaska and they're grass-fed organic meats, and they're still not feeling well. They're still anxious, mm -hmm. still depressed. And when we do our, our testing, we see that they're not, they don't have adequate amino acids in their blood. Mm -hmm. So they're eating protein, but they're not digesting and absorbing it. Mm -hmm. And that's due to poor a lack of hydrochloric acid, acid in the stomach, or poor digestion. And I, and I think why it's so important to talk about because our culture is obsessed with antacids, mm -hmm. right? You walk down the, any of the pharmacy aisles and you ask anybody that's ever been to a doctor or a GI doctor, they're all taking antacids. Right. And now we have pills that work for 24 hours that stop acid production. Mm. And I believe that contributes to individuals not adequately digesting their protein. Right, that makes perfect sense. I get it, totally. Um, so you may have, like, I know you briefly touched on this, but if we could dive a little deeper. So why is, why is protein digestion so important for people who are struggling with anxiety and depression? So let's just um, take uh, serotonin, right? Everybody who goes to a psychiatrist might get a pill for a medication, as uh, antidepressant that we use for anxiety and the doctor will say you have a serotonin deficiency. And we really don't know that, but for our bodies to make serotonin, we need tryptophan. It's mm -hmm. an amino acid that we get from protein. So we, we have a piece of chicken, we have an egg, and we need to break that down to 
the amino acids tryptophan, which then goes into the brain to make serotonin. So if we don't have adequate, what, what I call precursor amino acids, we're not gonna make enough serotonin to improve mood or decrease mm -hmm. anxiety. Got it. Um, okay, so, so how, how does one take amino acid supplements then? Well, I think the step before amino acid supplements is make sure you're digesting and absorbing the protein you're eating. So that's uh, monitoring, uh, being careful about uh, antacids if you don't need them. And number two, having adequate protein in the diet. The next step would be, uh, and a big part of our work is amino acid supplements. So we would look to provide individuals with amino acid supplements, sometimes a, um, a formula that's called just free form amino acids, all the essential amino acids in a powder so they can build the neurotransmitters. Other times you can buy at the health food store uh, targeted amino acid supplements. So you can buy tryptophan to make serotonin, or you can buy other amino acids to make some of the uh, precursors to some of the other neurotransmitters. Mm. Got it. So taking a, a quick step back for a moment, because I, I feel like I've kind of gone ahead of myself, but I'm, I want to go back to the, the stomach acid thing real quick. So for people who do suffer from like heartburn and all that kind of stuff, um, what suggestions do you have for them, obviously, as an alternative to be taking these antacids that are then affecting their ability to digest protein? So what, like, are there other, obviously, there's probably plenty of other dietary changes that could happen in order to prevent such things like um, indigestion, but what, what suggestions do you have there? Well, I would urge everyone to read about uh, reflux and, and stomach um, a GERD <laughs> is what it's called because mm -hmm. the vast majority of the time, and it's important that you consult with your doctor, it's actually due to a deficiency of acid, mm. not too much acid. And this is something we've known in the integrative world for. 40 years, people have been writing about it. So if you don't have adequate acid in your stomach, you don't close the sphincter, the, the little um, uh, a flap between the esophagus and the stomach, so you get the reflux. If you have adequate acid, the sphincter closes and you don't get acid reflux. So mm -hmm. I've had many, many patients over the years, colleagues and friends, they say they have indigestion and reflux and we give them digestive enzymes with acid and they don't have reflux anymore. Mm. So it's really important that individuals understand sometimes they have acid reflux because they have a deficiency of acid in the stomach. Yes, I, I, I don't know if you knew this about me, but I, I went and did my master's in nutrition at Bastyr University, which is a naturopathic medicine school. So yes. I, I do remember these conversations around that and how counterintuitive um, it is because obviously people are thinking, well, wait a second, I don't have enough of this, you know, I, or I have too much of this thing that is, you know, di digesting my food where it, that, that is not the case. So I love that you mentioned that. So, um, so let's see, how about like um, different, like what kinds of proteins? If, if we're obviously needing, we need to have adequate acid, we also need to have adequate protein that we're eating. Do you have recommendations on what kinds of protein or combinations of protein? Any, any suggestions there? No, I mean, as a, as a psychiatrist, um, seeing people struggling with anxiety and depression, um, I am really cautious about a, a vegan diet because oftentimes it does not provide enough protein. Many people can do very well on a vegetarian vegan diet. Some people can't. And in, in my experience, someone with strong family histories of, of depression and anxiety were trying to recover that to get adequate protein, they either need to supplement or eat more protein. So I don't have a specific, uh, the best protein one can eat. I think, again, it really focuses on the highest quality foods with the ability to digest and absorb that with adequate uh, digestive enzymes and acid. Mm, got it. So do you see like um, more people struggle? I mean, is, is there like scientific studies or whatever linked to the vegan diet and more of that anxiety and depression? I mean, I don't, I don't know much about that. Uh, well, certainly, um, you know, I also uh, treat eating disorders. Mm. It's a large part of... Um, 
uh, our practice during the day and uh, run an eating disorder hospital. And there's a clear uh, link between a vegan vegetarian diet and the onset of eating disorders and poor recovery from eating disorders. And again, most of what we're understanding in terms of mental illness and mental health is a genetic vulnerability. Doesn't mean genes cause it, but it contributes to that vulnerability. And many individuals, particularly our adolescents, which I'm most concerned about, their vegan diets are not healthy you know, diets. Mm -hmm. They're just avoiding yeah. meat. So they're not getting adequate zinc and B12 or protein. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's really careful um, to understand that a vegetarian vegan diet, you need to make sure you're meeting with a, a dietitian or understand nutrition enough to get the nutrients and protein that you need. Yes, not just eating fake meat and white bread. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> like, you know, or the pasta and potato chips. Right? Yes, the white, the, all the white foods and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so could you dive a little deeper into like, um, I guess, amino acids, neurotransmitters as it relates to anxiety and depression? Like what's the difference? What do we need for helping someone with anxiety versus depression? Are they just one in the same as far as that goes? Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, sure. I think the, the core of the, the work that we do called integrative psychiatry is the concept of, of biochemical individuality. Everybody's different. So we might see five patients the same age presenting with anxiety, and, and one patient might have the problem I discussed, eating perfect diet but of low levels of amino acids. So we need to give them digestive enzymes and amino acids. Someone else might have a, a B12 deficiency. Hmm. Someone else might have a, a zinc deficiency. You need the trace mineral zinc to make hydrochloric acid. So we see a lot of individuals hmm. um, with anxiety um, and depression that have a zinc deficiency. Uh, zinc, again, is in animal products. Uh, and there's lots of factors in our environment uh, where we're kind of uh, decreasing our uh, ability to absorb zinc. Mm -hmm. So we have multiple um, nutritional deficiencies associated with our ability to make these neurotransmitter chemicals in the brain. And sometimes the depressed patients are different, but it really is, I think, that genetic uh, vulnerability that's different. We can see the same nutritional deficiencies, one person getting depressed, one person being prone to uh, mm -hmm. anxiety. Got it. Got it. Interesting. Um, so like, what's your experience of, you know, you're, you've been in psychiatry for 30 plus years and you're, and you're tackling this from an angle, or at least what we're talking about today, right. Is, is how we digest our protein. What kind, you know, are we getting enough protein, all that kind of stuff. Like, do you think that this is missing in the world of therapy, et cetera, because not everybody taught, right. Not everybody talks about the, what foods we put in our bodies, um, as it relates to our mental health, a lot of times people are just focused more on, um, you know, our thoughts, our emotions, all that kind of stuff. Like, what do you, do you think it's something that is not being addressed enough? Uh, I, I clearly think it's not being addressed enough. I, I think that um, uh, the field of um, mental health has changed. We now can appreciate things like exercise and, and yoga and mindfulness and we have academic medical centers that say they have integrative uh, programs, but it's mainly focused on this, you know, mindfulness and um, exercise and yoga, which are all critically important. But my kind of focus has been the biological foundation. And if you're deficient in B12 or deficient in these amino acids, it's very hard to get benefit out of psychotherapy or even yoga or exercise. So my job has been to try to educate patients and doctors on that biological foundation, these nutritional deficiencies that affect brain function. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, so profound and so important. Obviously, we're right. These these whole and complete beings. And, and when we when we t leave out something as right, something as um, important as what we're putting into our body or how what we're putting into our body is being broken down and then, you know, off to do other things and, and functioning in different ways. It's just key. Um, so what is integrative psychiatry? Just for people who don't know what that means. I know that's obviously what you're, what you're up to. 
Sure. It's just, um, you know, a big uh, term that uh, just means we're going to do whatever uh, we can to help someone coming in uh, for treatment for anxiety and depression. Our current model in psychiatry is, you know, what I call the symptomatic band-aid. If you're sad, everyone gets an antidepressant. If you're anxious, everyone gets an anti-anxiety medicine. So we have this kind of symptom-based, we have a pill. Mm -hmm. And if it worked, that would be one thing, but it doesn't work as good as we thought. You know, 50%, half patients with depression get better. So integrative psychiatry just looks at the underlying cause. What might be contributing? That's where we look at nutritional deficiencies. We look at past uh, trauma. We look at uh, family history, what's going on in your life. So integrative psychiatry is looking at all aspects and really trying to focus on, on the root cause if we can find it. And it's not the current model of psychiatry, which is just symptom-based polypharmacy. Mm, yeah. So, so what about trauma? That that comes up, God, all over the place these days. And we wrapped up an event not long ago around healing from childhood trauma, and I learned so much about right how much obviously a um, adverse childhood experiences can affect us in our adult lives, affect our mental health, affect our physical health. Um, what do you see as the link between trauma and, and mood disorders like anxiety and depression? Well, I mean, it's, it's huge. And, and um, I'm glad you, you guys talked about trauma because it affects so much of our, uh, the patients struggling with anxiety and depression. The, the psychological um, experience obviously benefits from, from therapy, but what we're also finding is the physical changes that might have happened early on um, persist into adulthood. So we often see some of the many cases we've seen that we, you know, describe that um, eating the perfect foods but still not absorbing are individuals that had trauma. Mm -hmm. So I'll just take a minute to try to give you that because it's really important. So individuals that are doing everything they can to take care of their health, they're doing their yoga and they're doing therapy and they're eating the perfect foods, they had a trauma years ago. At that time, their body stopped producing acid and digestive enzymes. Mm. They, they were just kind of overwhelmed. Um, and their body, that fight or flight response, you kind of turn off your digestive system and just focus on the, the, the flight, the running and taking care of yourself. And so many of those patients haven't recovered adequate digestion years later. And these are many of the patients that we treat with amino acids and digestive enzymes. Mm, wow. Yeah, I hadn't. I had not thought about that. That makes perfect sense. Obviously, when we're when we're stuck in trauma, right? Our bodies are telling us to run from the saber toothed tiger or whatever's happened to us. And and yeah, why would we be focusing on digesting our food at that moment, right? So, oh, that's... And, and years later, even the the trauma is past, and we're dealing with it in therapy, but our bodies sometimes have not recovered. Uh huh. Absolutely. Got it. Uh, so do you see like, this is something I'm asking most people because I'm, I'm curious about it. I know that in just reading, like a lot of people have de depression and anxiety together, um, both of them at the same time. What, what's your experience of how often you see people struggling with both? Again, I've been practicing a, a long time and I would say over the past 10 years, it, it's probably the majority. Uh, I think that um, it used to be clearer somebody was sad and depressed, someone else was anxious or having panic attacks. Um, now we're seeing the vast majority of patients struggling with both depression and anxiety together. Mm. And I think that's primarily because of the um, kind of both the, the malnutrition and the treatment and our culture uh, all kind of combined to contribute to that. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit more about our culture for a second and, and like what other like lifestyle things or societal um, influences do you think are affecting uh, people obviously developing anxiety and depression? Well, again, with that kind of genetic vulnerability is really important. And, and then so much of our culture now is um, trying to be perfect. And, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, the perfect diet, the perfect job, the perfect spouse, the perfect exercise routine. And I, I think we're all just set up um, 
to kind of struggle with that. And I think that's certainly part of it. And then kind of our digital social media short attention span is also um, contributing a, uh, to that. And, and our diet, um, a lot of my work in, in, uh, in addition to protein is this lack of fat. Um, mm -hmm. The brain is 60% fat. So much of mental illness is associated with not eating adequate fats, so omega-3s in fish or even um, saturated fats. So our culture now demonizing fat, or certainly over the past 50 years, has affected um, anxiety and depression rates as well, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So what do you, do you have suggestions on, obviously you mentioned fish as far as omega-3s, um, any other suggestions on kinds of foods people could eat in, in that world with, with healthy fats? I, I think um, in terms of dietary suggestions as a psychiatrist, uh, most of it is, you know, eat healthy food, it's what not to eat. And I think the only thing would be refined sugar um, mm -hmm. that we see contributing to depression and anxiety. The, uh, foods to eat, having adequate uh, omega-3s in fish, in particular, it's more easily absorbed than, than, than nuts and seeds, have been associated with lower rates of depression, lower risk of suicide. Uh, so adequate omega-3s from fish would be a, a priority recommendation. Or if someone's not eating fish or can't tolerate it, then supplements with omega-3s. Mm -hmm. Got it. Excellent. Um, so here's another question and this is kind of um, slight sidetrack, but I'm just curious, like in, in your experience of psychiatry, <clears throat> it seems to be that obviously anxiety and depression can, can negatively impact our relationships in life and relationships, right? If we were all connected and having healthy relationships, I think we'd probably have less anxiety and depression. So do you have any, any thoughts around, um, the impact of anxiety and depression on our, on our, whether it's romantic relationships or, or relationships with friends, children, what have you? Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's uh, so much there. One, just the neurochemistry of a relationship. So the connection we have with other people, um, you know, affects our neurotransmitters as well. And, and so whether it's a psychotherapy or being able to talk with our friends or spouse or, or in, uh, friends. So the relationships have powerful neurochemical effects and, and that connection is important. And loneliness is, is a, a significant problem, uh, oftentimes more for, for the elderly, affecting mood and depression, but certainly um, with some of our kind of overconsumption with the internet and social media, social isolation, is affecting mood and anxiety. Mm -hmm. So our ability, one of the benefits that we have, you know, learned from psychotherapy, that connection with someone else is therapeutic. And we now know that there's a powerful chemistry related to that, uh, both the listening part, as well as the communicating part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. So I know we've like touched on, I feel like so many different things as it relates to this topic today, all of them so important. Um, be, since we started with the amino acids and protein digestion and amino acid supplementation, is there anything else you want to say around that um, for anybody before we move on to talking about your webinar? Well, just to kind of repeat that, you know, eating a healthy diet so dietary intake is not always um, related to what we see when we do these tests. So I think it's important if someone is struggling with anxiety or depression to see a, a functional or integrative medicine person, to see if they are absorbing the nutrients they are, they're getting and the, the, the high quality diet that they're spending the extra money for. So if they're struggling for anxiety or depression, to make sure they're absorbing the nutrients and because it's easily treated. Um, so I think that's a really important message. How, so how, how is that? How is malabsorption treated then? Well, we would find out the cause. It could be celiac disease mm. um, that could contribute to it um, untreated. Many, uh, some of the first symptoms of celiac disease could be depression and anxiety. People okay. think it, you have to have GI problems. And then we would um, use the digestive enzymes with hydrochloric acid and we would provide amino acid supplements. And within a couple of months, people feel dramatically better, oftentimes without medication. Mm, 
Got it. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate you wrapping, wrapping that all together. And, and so people can, um, you know, take a, take this at many different angles. So I want to let everyone know there's a button below this interview right now, this video, and it leads over to a webinar that you have for everyone. So could you just share a little bit about what that is, what, what everyone could learn by registering for your free webinar? Uh, sure. This was a, um, a lecture that I gave um, looking at um, irritability, anger, and rage. Um, such an important part of our lives that we don't even talk about and we don't think of getting help for. And, and the focus is looking at some of the underlying uh, biological uh, nutritional deficiencies that contribute to irritability and this low frustration tolerance. So we look at uh, trace minerals like high copper. We look at other uh, minerals um, and uh, uh, always and the GI tract. So I go through a series of nutritional deficiencies that affect low frustration tolerance and irritability. Mm, I love that topic. That's right. <laughs> I can totally see that as beneficial for anxiety and depression, right? I'm sure that that ties into those quite well in the world Absolutely. of... <laughs> okay, got it. Well, thank you. And everyone, I highly recommend you click that button below and go take a look at Dr. Greenblatt's webinar. It's totally free for you. Are there any last insights, anything else that you feel like we've left out or anything else you want to dive into before we wrap up? Well, I mean, just in summary, in, uh, in the integrative psychiatry world, we have some doctors saying medications are evil and just take vitamins. And some people say vitamins have no research and just take pills. And I'm just um, been in the field long enough to I think both approaches are wrong and we need to kind of understand that there might be a role for medicines, but if we can look at the underlying cause, then nutritional supplements, uh, amino acids, fatty acids, and vitamins can make a huge difference in those struggling with anxiety and depression. Mm, awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, thank you so much for all of this and all the amazing work you're doing. And I really appreciate you taking a look at this this topic of anxiety and depression as it relates to how we digest our food and really, you know, diving into that amino acids and everything. I appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting us. Absolutely. And thank you everyone for showing up. I like to say this at the end of pretty much every class, you know, you're showing up for yourself right now. That's the first step to overcoming anxiety and depression to moving forward and creating more happiness, peace, and joy in your life. So good, good for you for being here. And thank you so much for tuning in. All right. Take care, everybody. Hey everyone, I just wrapped up another great class with Dr. James Greenblatt, and we talked about overcoming anxiety and depression with amino acid supplements. So he talked with us about many things beyond that as well, but he talked about the importance of making sure that you're actually digesting the protein that you're eating and making sure that you have adequate protein in the diet. And if you're potentially not digesting the protein that you're eating, to take amino acid supplements because these are these building blocks to help create these neurotransmitters like for example serotonin like he mentioned which regulates our mood and helps with things like depression anxiety etc so overall his his you know overall take on all of this is he is he practices integrative psychiatry which ultimately looks at the underlying cause of why it is that you're suffering from anxiety why it is that you might be suffering from from depression and takes a look at it from that root cause as opposed to ultimately just right putting a band-aid over something and not taking a look at what caused that wound in the first place. He also talked about talked about trauma speaking of underlying causes. Trauma, right, when our bodies are naturally designed to when we are at risk, when we are at risk of, of being hurt, harmed, what have you, our bodies go into this fight or flight state, right? And in that fight or flight state, our digestive system is not focused on digesting. We're focused on running or getting away from whatever scenario we're in and helping ourselves survive, right? We're working on surviving, not digesting our food. So that obviously can turn off our digestive system as well as, excuse me, the production of that hydrochloric acid, which is obviously once again, so important in protein digestion, which leads to us being able to create those neurotransmitters that affect our mental health. So so that is one major underlying cause 
as he mentioned, of anxiety and depression. So if you've, if you've had things like trauma in your life. So one other thing I wanted to mention is that we talked really a little bit more about right, the prevalence of anxiety and depression in our society today, in our culture today. And he mentioned that we're all trying to be perfect. And I smile at this because that is so me and I am always a recovering perfectionist, right? Are you trying to be perfect at your job? Are you trying to be perfect in the kind of exercise you do? Are you trying to be perfect in the diet that you eat? Are so many people um, compare their normal lives to the highlight reel of others through things like social media and believing that because that person's Instagram photo was so beautiful in that moment that their life must be so perfect, right? When the reality is potentially after that photo, their life was not so perfect. So, right, we're oftentimes comparing our lives to like a snapshot of what we see as perfection in somebody else's. And that can have a huge, massive effect on our mental state. That can create anxiety to try to be perfect. That can create depression and hopelessness. So is this something that you do? It's just something to be aware of. So where are you trying to be perfect in your life? And how can you focus on potentially letting go of that and just being who you are, right? We are all perfect in our imperfections, right? We are all uniquely imperfect and just being who you are is the most important thing. So hope you got out a lot out of this latest class with Dr. Greenblatt and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks everybody. Mm -hmm.